So this edition of AEW Dynamite was the go-home show before full gear, and it kicked off with Brian Danielson facing off against Rocky Romero in Romero's Dynamite debut. But yo, I gotta talk about this for a sec, because they said that Orange Cassidy was asked to join the Chaos faction over in New Japan by Kazuchika Okada himself. And I know AEW and New Japan have a partnership going, but if they could bring in Okada, we're gonna have to make a new word for the amount of winning AEW is doing in this war. But this match ended when Rocky attempted to go for a sliced bread, but Brian countered by doing his move where he grabs his opponent's wrists and just starts stomping on his opponent's head. And then Danielson applied the Tequila Sunrise and Rocky Romero tapped out. And then Tony Schiavone was in the ring to interview the Inner Circle about their Minneapolis street fight at full gear against the Men of the Year and American Top Team. But as the Inner Circle was making their entrance to do their interview, American Top Team and the Men of the year blindsided them and attacked them and they punctuated the attack when scorpio sky and ethan page lifted jericho onto lambert's shoulders who was on the top turnbuckle and he delivered a top rope powerbomb through a table and ethan page said that they're gonna make sure that dan lambert is the one that pins jericho and to further humiliate him lambert put jericho in the walls of jericho and scorpio sky puppeteered jericho and made him tap out and then we had a trios tag team match and I already knew this match was going to happen since last week's Dynamite, but Britt Baker, Jamie Hayter, and Rebel took on Anna Jay, Ty Conti, and Thunder Rosa, and this match told a good story to build up to the women's world title match at full gear when Conti hit Rebel with a DD tie, but Britt just watched from the outside and didn't interfere, which gave the impression that maybe Britt was afraid of Ty Conti and the possible threat she posed to her AEW women's world title reign. And then Jungle Boy took on Anthony Bowens, and in the end, Jungle Boy would lock in the snare trap submission on Anthony Bowens to make him tap out. And then Bobby Fish came out after the match and attacked Jungle Boy, which I initially thought was kind of weird because you'd think that the super click would come out to attack Jungle Boy, but it ended up being Bobby Fish, which made sense a little later. But for the moment, Christian Cage and Luchasaurus ended up coming out and Bobby Fish retreated. And in the next segment, Bobby Fish coming out made sense because backstage Adam Cole was with the Young Bucks and Adam Cole introduced one of his old faction members in the Undisputed Era, Bobby Fish, to his new faction members in the Super Click, the Young Bucks. So I thought this was really cool how they were maintaining continuity with what happened in NXT with the Undisputed Era. And they also maintained some continuity with what happened in Ring of Honor when Matt Jackson said that they were already familiar with Bobby Fish given the tag team wars between the Young Bucks and Red Dragon. And then they also set up a match on Rampage for Bobby Fish by putting him in a match against Jungle Boy. And with the news of Kyle O'Reilly's contract in NXT expiring in December, December, I really want to believe that AEW is currently planting the seeds for Cole leaving the Elite and reforming the Undisputed Era within AEW. I went into this a little bit further in one of my previous reviews, but if Kyle O'Reilly shows up in AEW next year, I can't even begin to imagine the dream matches we could have. I mean, we could reignite the Red Dragon Young Bucks rivalry. We can create an absolute dream faction feud between the Elite and the Undisputed Era. Like, this is the first time we're seeing Adam Cole and Bobby Fish converse with one another in AEW, and I think it's going to be the start of all that, which I'm so excited for. And then next, we had Wardlow facing off against Wheeler Yuta. And this match was just an absolute squash match. Wardlow just powerbombed Yuta over and over again. And finally, Wardlow finished things off with his casualty of war finisher and then pinned Wheeler Yuta to get the win. And as Orange Cassidy and Chuck Taylor were checking up on Wheeler Yuta, they continued the rivalry that Orange Cassidy had with Matt Hardy in the Hardy family office by having the Blade and Isaiah Cassidy attack Orange and Chuck Taylor. And finally, Matt Hardy came into the ring and finished the assault by putting Orange Cassidy's head in a steel chair and then hitting him with a twist of hate. 
And if I'm being honest, I honestly don't know why this rivalry is still going, because the last I remembered, Orange Cassidy faced off against that one guy from the family office. I, I really don't remember his name, but they had that hair versus hair match, and Orange Cassidy beat him, so you would think that the rivalry would be over there, but I guess they're still continuing it now, which I'm honestly not a huge fan of, because I think it's just dragged on a bit too long. And then during a commercial break, we found out that Eddie Kingston and CM Punk were brawling in the parking lot. And to be honest, I think they're actually doing a pretty good job building this match with so little time left, because this match was kind of put together last minute for full gear, and I didn't really know if they were going to be able to build it properly with such a short amount of time, but I think they're actually doing alright, what with the really good promo war on the last Rampage and this cool backstage segment during this edition of Dynamite. And then next, we had a match between the team of Lee Moriarty and Matt Seidel, and the team of Dante, Martin, and Leo Rush. And I guess this was the Dynamite debut of Leo Rush, which doesn't really feel right because after debuting at the last Double or Nothing as the Joker, it feels like he should have had at least one match on Dynamite by now. I don't know, whatever. Either way, Dante Martin and Leo Rush were probably not going to lose because they've done all this buildup on Leo Rush being the game changer to Dante Martin's career, so if they lost here, I don't think it really would have made any sense, and the past few weeks of them being in backstage segments would have kind of gone to waste if they had their first showing and they just lost. So in the end, Moriarty ended up taking the pin when Leo Rush hit a hook kick to Moriarty and Dante Martin hit a double springboard moonsault to get the win. And then Dax Harwood took on Pac, and this match was a really good technical wrestling match, and the match ended when Pac locked in the Brutalizer on Dax and he tapped out. And then Cash Wheeler, Malachi Black, and Andrade El Idolo showed up, and they all began to assault Pac, but the Lucha Brothers and Cody Rhodes ended up coming out to even the odds, and Andrade, Malachi, and FTR retreated. And then to end the show, we had the contract signing for the World Championship match at full gear. And per the orders of Tony Khan, the Elite and the Dark Order were banned from the contract signing, so it was just Omega and Paige one-on-one. -on -one. And they talked a bit about their history together, and Paige even brought up Kenny Omega's stint in the Golden Lovers with Kota Ibushi. But in the end, Omega offered to shake Paige's hand, which Paige accepted, and then Paige was blasted from behind by the cameraman, who turned out to be Don Callis. And it turned out that Paige was busted open, and Omega used Paige's blood to sign the contract and close out the show. So overall, a pretty good go-home show, and we'll see what happens on the go-home show for Rampage on Friday.